attivato l'audio. Ok, thank you to you all. It is my pleasure to introduce Ken. It is my pleasure to introduce Enrico Zwarva. I think we all know his name. And he has the honor to open this uh, workshop. So please, Enrico, I hope you heard me. Please. Yes, so thank you. Thank you. Good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you for this kind invitation. I'm sorry not to be in Rome, but I was previously engaged to be in Urbino uh, for a workshop on, on hypo-coercive uh, and hypoelytic equations, so a topic that is actually in some sense related to, to the one I'm going to address here. So thank you for the organizers for this kind invitation and in particular to Colombo that, uh, you know, was always in contact with me and never gave up. So I, I realized that I have given a, a, a terrible title to, to the lecture, uh, although this really reflects in, in some sense uh, the general frame in which my presentation will arise. Uh, but I could have given a, a more, say, technical, precise and explicit title saying that I will talk about uh, time inversion of Hamilton-Jacobi equations and scalar conservation laws in one space dimensions. But this will have been maybe a bit too long, right? So this is a joint work with uh, Carlos Esteve, who got a thesis in Sorbonne University in Paris 6. Uh, like two or three years ago, and now he's working in the artificial intelligence company Sherpa in Bilbao, and uh, Thibault Liard got a PhD in the same university a few years ago, and then has been with uh, Benedetto Piccoli, then with us uh, as a postdoc, and now he has his permanent position in France, uh, maybe in Limoges. Okay, so uh, you see, I got uh, my attention to this problem was uh, brought to me like 50 years ago or so when I was uh, the advisor of the PhD thesis of Francisco Palacios, who was an aeronautical engineer working in Madrid in connection with Airbus. And, uh, and then he put us in contact with Juan Alonso, who is a Spanish professor of aeronautics in Stanford. Uh, a few years later, they wrote this very interesting survey article on the optimization of the of the sonic boom problem and so very very briefly i mean this is a very classical problem but the idea is very simple i mean this is an uh, in some sense an optimal shape design problem that is too complicated so you simplify it in the following way so you want to find the optimal shape of an uh, a supersonic aircraft so that when when traveling uh, when flying over populated uh, lands right the sonic boom signal when getting to earth is mild enough so that it can be tolerated by by humans and also by the infrastructure right so the way you address this is to say okay i want to find the optimal shape of this aircraft so that when the signal gets uh, to earth you know it's uh, small enough okay so then you can immediately formulate it as an optimal control or optimization problem you are shaping the initial datum somehow through the shape of the aircraft, and then you are trying to achieve a goal at the final time, right? So then, of course, when you are doing this, this is like a shooting problem, you could think also in the reverse sense of time. So given the final target, right, try to tell what is the initial datum that corresponds to it, okay? So this is a time inversion problem. Of course, there is a lot of modeling on this, and the first thing you do is you take this, uh, uh, um, uh, shape of the three-dimensional aircraft and you simplify it into, say, an initial uh, signature, right, through uh, the width and functions and so on, okay? Uh, there are many other applications in which this time reversal problem will be, you know, will be of application. So, in particular, whenever you are trying to understand what is the origin of any catastrophe, right, or, for instance, a pollution problem, you observe pollution on a lake, on a river, and then you try to trace back, you know, the trajectory of this pollution to identify where the source of pollution or the different sources of pollution were located and, and how, you know, how intense each of, one, each of them was. So, from a mathematical perspective, 
Uh, the problem is very simple to, you know, to formulate. You could think in terms of Cochi, as Cochi said, a Cochi problem is take an abstract evolution dynamics like UT plus AU equals zero, can be finite dimensional, infinite dimensional, linear, nonlinear, autonomous, non-autonomous, and so on. So Cochi said, what you have to do is to, to find the right space, say capital H or capital X, so that whenever U zero is given in that space, there is a unique trajectory continuous in time with values in that space and so on. So the Hadamard uh, classical well-posedness. And then if you ask me about tracing the initial datum back out of some field measurements done at a final time capital T, right? So I measure today, but I want to go know what it was the origin yesterday, right? Then the only thing you do, okay, you formulate the Cauchy problem in the backward sense of time. Why not? If you want to, you can also make it look like an initial uh, value problem by just changing T into minus T. Of course, then you will get a minus A instead of an A. And then you say, is this problem well posed also in the Hadamard sense? Then, of course, when you are looking to this, there are at least three different scenarios. And as you will see, the nonlinear models you are, we are considering, like Hamilton Jacobi or scalar conservation laws in 1D, the same problem will arise in multi-D, but we don't know how to solve it. Then there are at least three scenarios. The simplest one, the most beautiful one, is the, is the classical D'Alembert, the, the classical um, wave equation, or any model related to it, like a Schrodinger uh, elasticity, Maxwell, and so on. Then this equation is purely reversible in time. I don't really need the energy identity. I mean, it could be dissipative, and then I will have grown walls in both senses on time. So there is no problem. If you give me the datum at the final time, I can solve the Cauchy problem backwards in time. It's perfectly well posed in the energy space with the corresponding uh, estimates, right? Of course, if the forward model is dissipative, in the backward model, you will see an exponential growth of energy, yet in a finite time interval, you will have very nice estimates and you will be able to say, fine, no problem. If you give me a final datum in the correct energy space, I know there will be a unique initial datum in the correct functional setting also, right? And I can achieve the initial datum out of the final one by solving the semi-group backwards, which is perfectly well posed in the backward sense of time. So the second example is time reversibility, very much related to image processing and many other topics, right? Is the heat equation. So in the heat equation, you still say, well, fine, we have Fourier series. They were invented for this, actually. Uh, we know the Cauchy problem is well posed. There is a very strong dissipative effect that you can observe here, right? When you say that the, the you know, frequency-wise, the energy at the final time is exponentially uh, dissipated according to the corresponding eigenvalue lambda k, right? So higher and higher and higher dissipation rates at higher frequencies. Yet, you know, you can establish a one-to-one -one correspondence between the Fourier coefficients of the initial datum and the final datum. And you can again say, listen, if you give me a final measurement, I can give you what, uh, I can tell you what the initial datum is, and I can write down the, you know, the Fourier expression, the Fourier representation. Now, if you ask me whether the problem is well posed, this is more tricky, right? And this is related to Tikhonov and many other well-known phenomena and stabilities uh, for the heat equation, right? So the backward resolution of the heat equation is very badly uh, uh, imposed, right? You can see the same in the context of the Cauchy problem in REM. You can uh, write down the solution of the forward problem using uh, the convolution with the Gauss uh, heat kernel. And then you try to undo this convolution and you will see that although theoretically there is a unique solution, this solution is very hard to achieve, right? So basically the exercise is similar to putting milk in coffee, right? And then mix it. And after, you know, you have got your uh, cafe latte, uh, you decide that actually you wanted an espresso. Uh, and then you try to unmix, right? Just uh, turning the spoon, you know, all the way back, right? It will never work. The same happens for the Gaussian. You can again use the Fourier transform 
to establish a one-to-one -one correspondence between every frequency of the initial signal and the convoluted one. But when you try to go back, you will see an exponential imposedness at the high frequencies. Although, you know, uh, some people here, right? Certainly I see, for instance, in my, in my photos here, in, in some sense, I see some old friends like uh, Denise. Certainly Denise uh, knows uh, this, this uh, computation very, very well. I, I think I learned it from some lecture notes of Tartar. Then there were papers by Gidaglia on this. Certainly this goes, I mean, this has been, uh, there was a very nice paper by Jacques Lyons with Malgrange on Carleman inequalities, uh, time-dependent Carleman inequalities to do the same. So there is actually a, a way to uh, quantify this lack of backward uh, stability by energy uh, estimates, right? So, and, and I like this computation very much. I, I always teach this, try to teach this to, you know, to master students, because, you know, in just one slide, you see how in this case, you are so lucky to do things explicitly, but on the other hand, you see also what the complexity of the problem is. So for those that never saw this computation, this is something really to, you know, that uh, deserves uh, some attention. It's very simple and you will never forget it, right? So you write the energy identity for the heat equation. Normally we use it in the forward sense to say that the energy is being dissipated and the solutions decay exponentially according to Poincaré and Gronwald. But now I want to go back forward in time. So what I do, you know, the dissipation rate of the gradient y squared, I write it down in terms of the L2 norm. Of course, for this, there is a coefficient lambda, capital lambda that depends on T, which is called the frequency number, which is just the Rayleigh quotient, gradient y squared divided by y squared. Of course, all the analysis of PDs will be true if the reverse of the Poincaré inequality will be, you know, will hold. But this is, you know, false, of course. So lambda cannot be bounded, right? So it is not true that the H1 norm can be bounded by the L2 norm. But the key observation is, that here you are not dealing with all possible functions in H1 of omega. You are just dealing with the solution of a given trajectory of the heat equation. And then the observation is that you are patient and you compute the time derivative of this uh, frequency number lambda, you will see decays. And this is natural because if you think to, you know, on the Fourier representation, you already observe that if your initial datum has, for instance, just a finite number of Fourier components involved, the dynamics will never generate higher frequencies. So the frequency number, which is somehow, you know, the, the upper bound, right, on, on the number of frequencies involved on the dynamics is, can never increase, right? So because lambda decreases, lambda is therefore smaller than lambda zero. So you get a reverse Poincaré inequality under the condition that you limit yourself to look to the subspace generated by the trajectory itself, right? Which also explains why many techniques on model reduction for parabolic solutions and so on, right, uh, work, right? You can generate bases in which, you know, the trajectory leave and be in finite dimensional. And then because of that, you have the reverse, you know, uh, energy identity, and you can end up getting this estimate in which you say, listen, out of the final datum Y capital T, you can get the norm of the initial datum, but you pay a very, you know, substantial price, right? Because you have to take into account that the constant in the estimation can depend on the exponential of this frequency number, okay? So then you see why in eventually you will end up getting an ill pose problem when you let the number of frequencies increase more and more and more. So by the way, I have to say that this is also a terrible numerical problem, right? Because if you will try to write in the computer, and there is still research uh, uh, being done on this, right? If you try to write in the computer and you know, an algorithm that out of the solution of the heat equation in time, capital T equal 10 gives you the solution at T equals zero, you will see how rapidly it will simply uh, blow up and will never lead to anything concrete. Okay, so then wave equation, fast fantastic uh, time inversion and wave poseness in the backward sense. Heat equation, backward uniqueness, but instability that you can estimate through these logarithmic inequalities. 
And then typically problems like conservation laws motivated by the sonic boom problem of, uh, you know, of uh, supersonic aircrafts. Uh, conservation laws or Hamilton-Jacobi equations in which solutions generate singularities. And when this happens, then you lose backward uniqueness. So you see here on the, on the bottom of this page, you see two initial datum for the Vargas equation, right? In which when you solve the equation forward, you will get to the same identical final datum, you know, at time capital T. Both of them, you know, you just follow the classical recipes of the Riemann problem for the Vargas equation, admissible shocks propagate as shocks, you know, according to rankine uconian velocity, unadmissible shocks generate rarefactions, and you see how you can produce two different initial data, right, which generate the same final target at the final time. Actually, when you start thinking a little bit on this, you probably, the experts already realize, right, that you can replace this ramp by infinitely many step uh, functions, right, and then generate an infinite number of initial data that, you know, converge, actually coincide at the final time with the same target. So then when you analyze the same problem for the Vargas equation, you see that there is a catastrophe. So given a final measurement, there are infinitely many initial data so that by forward resolution, they lead to the same final uh, measurement. Okay, and I emphasize here that I'm not going into, you know, the, the class of weak solutions of uh, conservation laws that are not entropic. No, no, no. Here I am talking just about the forward resolution of the Vargas equation using entropic forward dynamics. So the claim is there are situations in which out of a natural target at final time for the Vargas equation, or, you know, any other convex scalar conservation law in 1D, right? Out of any target, right? In the final time, there are infinitely many initial data that lead to it, okay? So this is a catastrophe from the point of view of uh, backward uniqueness. So now what we do? So what are the challenges? Well, just to make things clear, here we are talking just about, you know, the classical, entropy or viscosity semigroup associated to the Vargas equation. You could formulate, of course, the same problem for any scalar conservation law, right? In which you have a Khrushchev theory, for instance, right? So then, no ambiguity. We are just talking about forward resolution using the entropy semigroup. You could consider other classes of weak solutions, and then the problem will have to be reanalyzed again. But we place ourselves in a context in which we accept that the physics is modeled, the forward physics is modeled by this entropy semigroup that we understand well in the context of uh, conservation laws. So now, what are the goals? So from a practical perspective, people will tell you, well, just make it a shooting problem. Just write it down as a uh, uh, least square problem. You want to drive your semi-group out of an unknown initial datum U0 that you need to identify to the final target. Why don't you just minimize the distance in L2 of the solution generated by U0, right, to the target? In case the target is really a true solution of, you know, a true, say, trace of a solution of the Vargas equation, there is one U0, and you should be able to find it, just apply minimization algorithms, right? And in case the UT is not really a true solution of your Vargas equation, something that could happen because, you know, we have introduced some noise or defect on our measurement, then the algorithm will tell you also, will tell you, yeah, I mean, be careful, Enrique, you say that this is a true solution of the Vargas equation, we tell you this is not. There was certainly some error, right? And the error is given by the gap on this distance, right? And this was probably due to the fact that your sensor is old, I mean, your battery is uh, off, or your hand was shaking, okay? So this is the way you could do. And then you say, well, then this is perfect. I will apply a gradient descent algorithm. What is the difficulty when you do this? is that the solution of the Vargas equation generates shocks. And then defining what is the Frechet derivative or the Gadot derivative of this functional, then is tricky. 
And this is something that has been analyzed for many years. I mean, I, of course, I don't, I don't, uh, I didn't write here all the names, but just some of those that I have read, uh, read on this: Lefloc, Bresan, Bouchoujan, Ulbricht, and, and many others, right? So where you see that actually when you linearize the Barger semigroup, you have to go back to the classical uh, understanding of uh, Bargers as being, you know, pieces of smooth solutions connected by interfaces where shocks propagate and view this Bargers equation as a multi-physics problem in which, you know, the shock is something like a, a particle floating in a fluid, right? Like a, a free boundary problem, right? And linearize both the Barger's equation and also the free boundary condition uh, given by the rankine uranio dynamics. So this is tricky and therefore is not easy at all to implement that numerically. So you say, well, you know, uh, I was given a very natural problem in the simplest case, Barger's. I have formulated this in a least square context, which is very natural. And immediately I realized there are severe uh, numerical difficulties. Okay, so then the other possibility is just to try to do it from uh, in an analytic way, right? But we have already seen that in some cases, given an UT, <coughs> like, you know, the, the, the previous, uh, say, target I have given you in this example, right? Given an UT, can be, there can be infinitely many U zeros. So this functional in that case will be a function as with an infinite number of minimizers, right? So even analytically, very probably it will be hard, right? So to identify all this initial data. And of course, it will be even much more complicated to understand how different algorithms will lead to some or to the others. And this is something we discussed in this uh, Indian paper with Laurent Goss uh, published four years ago out of a workshop that was run, uh, organized by Laurent uh, a few years ago in, uh, in Sapienza as well, okay? So how, you know, if there are infinitely many wells, even if you build a numerical algorithm and you get something, how you will know in which well you are. And you see, this is somehow a, a, a drawback of a substantial uh, fraction of the literature on inverse problems, right? Where, you know, in general, in mathematical inverse theory, people say, given these measurements, there is one compatible solution. And I, even though the problem is imposed numerically, I can build an algorithm, cook an algorithm with the stabilizers and so on, that seems to be leading to this solution. But this is not really the answers the engineers are looking at. I mean, this is the same as when we go to the doctor, right? When you go to the doctor, you know, you don't want the doctor to say, well, your symptoms are compatible with COVID. Yeah, but they are compatible with COVID, but maybe it could also be that uh, yesterday I had too much wine or I just had a cold, right? So as a patient, you don't want the doctor to give you one possible scenario which is compatible with your symptoms. You want the doctor to be able to identify all the possible scenarios and out of them identify the one that corresponds to your actual situation. So then in practice, in inverse problems, rather than trying to build mathematically just one configuration which is compatible, which is compatible with the data we have, we should be able to say, well, this is the collection of all, this is the menu of all the possible configurations that are compatible with your measurements, and then say, but I can guarantee that the highest probability, the one that corresponds to your case is, you know, the minimizer number 10, right? Okay, so this is what we want to do. Now, uh, you see that when you are talking about targets, as I said, the very first question that arises is all targets, you know, in the space uh, look the same, behave the same for this, for this problem. And the answer is definitely not, right? The answer is definitely not, because in particular for the Vargas equation, we know this, uh, say, one sided Lipschitz condition by Eleni. We know that every solution of the Vargas equation, you know, experiences some dissipative effects so that the x derivative of u is really bounded by one over t. So if you give me a, a measurement for the Barger's equation at the final time, the first thing I will do is to check what is the x derivative. If it is below one over t, I will tell you, well, this is very likely a solution of Barger's. 
If this uh, unilateral one-sided ellipsis condition is not fulfilled, I will immediately tell you this is definitely not a solution of bargain. This is because you know you got this measurement because your hand was shaking. So the first thing to do is to you know try to split the phase space, the Banach or the Hilbert space in which the semigroup is um, evolving, and try to establish some threshold on which you say. This initial data, I mean, this, these uh, targets are reachable and those are out of the, you know, image of the semigroup. This is a bit like similar when you are dealing with, uh, say, blowing up uh, dynamical systems, trying to separate, you know, the whole, you know, split the whole space space, right, into those initial data that lead to global solutions and those that blow up. And as we know well, the geometry of these nonlinear, say, uh, separate on uh, manifold can be extremely complicated. Okay, so in this particular case in 1D, we have a good understanding. Okay, so by now, uh, because you were convinced already that minimizing this functional using gradient descent is maybe not such a good idea because of the difficulties related with, the, in particular, the linearization of the system, there is certainly an idea that you see also in the papers by Aru, Aru and uh, no Aru and Bloom, Jack Bloom in Nice, right? Which is to say, okay, why I don't simply solve the Vargas equation backwards? Okay, but then what does it mean to solve the Vargas equation backwards? It means defining a new backward entropy solution. And the new backward entropy solution is built in the same way, but now you have to put the viscosity in the in the opposite sense, right? So then, as, as described here, a very natural answer to the problem will be take your final measurement and then wherever this final measurement is, use the backward resolution, backward entropic uh, simulation of burgers, you get an initial datum and then you will solve it forward again. I know this will not always work because I can always do the backward forward entropic, say, uh, commutator, right? But I know that there are targets for burgers that are not achieved if they don't fulfill the Olenic condition. So something is going on, right? Okay. And then actually what we proved in this paper with uh, Thibault Liard was that if you adopt the point of view of the minimization in an analytical manner without getting into the technical difficulties of making this, uh, you know, uh, numerical, right? If you do this backward entropy resolution and then forward entropy resolution, what you really get is really the projection in L2 of your measured data into the space of reachable targets fulfilling the Olenic condition. So this is fantastic because in some sense we say there is a very distinguished initial datum that is very much the, the one that the doctor will choose for your symptoms which is the one given by the backward resolution of, you know, entropy resolution of the Vargas equation. This is the ideal one, right? Because it's the nicest one and it guarantees that you get as close as possible to the target, right? And all other ones will lead you to the same final, say, destination. Now, if you want to describe all these final ones, then you have to read the paper by Colombo and Perolas, with where with all detail uh, the problem is completely analyzed from an analytical perspective and they tell you you give me a final target which is compatible with olenic then i give you a description of what is the class of all initial data compatible with it okay good now when you see this analysis you realize that of course it's very much based on the very explicit computations one can do on burgers, right? Of course, it will not apply for more general problems. In particular, the problem, this beautiful problem is open for the scalar conservation laws in multi-D. But when you read the paper of Colombo Perola, you, you really feel that something uh, somehow uh, is on the air and is not really completely exploited. And the point is that this issue is much better understood when rather than working with burgers, you move into you know the Hamilton Jacobi space, right? And then the theory becomes multidimensional. Before I move to Hamilton Jacobi, just a quick example, you see here on the top left, a final target for Vargas that is not achievable because you know all any condition is not fulfilled. The X derivative of U uh, is full of direct deltas that do not have the upper bound one over capital T. 
Then, you know, you move top to the right, you know, uh, on the backward sense of the entropy uh, semigroup, uh, and you get this piecewise linear oblique function. And then out of this, now you solve, you know, you move left down, you solve again, you know, the uh, Barger's equation forward entropic, and then you see the, the red, you know, oblique, you know, piecewise uh, linear function over there. This oblique linear red, piecewise linear red function is the projection, right, of the final target that was not reachable, you know, onto, you know, the, the Barger's uh, manifold or, or set that you can really achieve, okay? And then you can see in these videos how if the target is this red function, piecewise linear, right, um, uh, continuous uh, function, there are all these blue different configurations that some of them very smooth or say simple and some of them very chaotical. And what is amazing is that all of them, all of them will lead you right to the same, to the same final target. Okay, so this is somehow a manifestation of the fact that necessarily the answer given by Colombo and Perolas has to be complicated because there are very increasingly, I mean, the complexity of the initial data that are compatible with a given target is unlimited. So in this drawing, you see a very simple scheme. You give me a final measurement. I go backwards with the red semigroup, red entropic uh, backward semigroup to a blue initial datum, right? I take this blue initial datum, now I solve Barger's forward, and I will get to a different location, the, the green spot, which is not necessarily the one originated the problem, but is the optimal one. Now, this being a good solution to the problem, there are infinitely many others that eventually in the forward resolution of the semigroup will lead to the same destination. And of course, the challenge was to describe all of them and to analyze what is the liveliness? This is what is done in the paper by Colombo and Perolas. So our point was, you understand all this better when you move into the Hamilton-Jacobi wall. As you know, you can just do it by a space integration. So from now on, I look to the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. And then you can do it also in the multi-descents. The Hamilton-Jacobi equation in the multi-descents has many uh, contexts, has many motivations. One of them is control. And it's very interesting that in this context, right, this problem of backward resolution of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation matches the challenges of, you know, the theory of reinforcement learning, where so much has been done in the last few years. This is one of the, of the big paradigms of machine learning, right? Uh, it was mainly done by computer scientists, right? In which they really understood the challenge of, you know, the fact that, for instance, for recommendation systems in internet, you know, when you are buying on any 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 web page, you know, the the managers the or the robot that is managing this web page doesn't know you, it doesn't know how much money you have, what do you like, but they have to discover it. So, in some sense, these are problems in which typically you don't know the dynamics that can be highly nonlinear as the behavior of a human being, right? You don't know the dynamics. You don't know really the goal because nobody knows what the goal is. It's like when you buy a car, you want to buy a car, but you really don't know exactly which car or a bicycle. You don't know exactly which bicycle you, you, you want to buy, whether it's a road bicycle, a hybrid, a mountain bike, whether it's electric or not, and so on. You don't really know exactly how much money you will end up paying, right? So this is reinforcement learning. You have to discover the dynamics and you have also to discover what is the cost function that is driving, you know, the psychology of, of, of this customer, right? And then this problem arises. In this particular case, identifying the initial datum out of final measurements for Hamilton-Jacobi equation is just one of the problems that arises in optimal control theory when you try to discover what is the cost functional that is generating all these optimal strategies, okay? And then the goals are the same for Hamilton-Jacobi. Solve Hamilton Jacobi backwards. Tell me how many initial data there are, uh, how do they look, and how I can build. Is there one that is distinguished from the others, and so on? And then you can do that in the multi setting just by using the you know the, the the paradigm of viscosity solution. We have a very nice forward semigroup. Maybe you could choose another one, but I only work with the forward viscosity semigroup. And in this context, I ask you the question. Given a final measurement, please tell me 
all you know about the class of inertial data that lead to this final destination, right? In this case, of course, you can also enjoy all the half logs formula, logs uh, logs uh, whole formula. You also have the backward entropic semi-group, of course, that you can define just by tuning the sign of the viscosity uh, opposite, right? And you have then the two semi-groups, the forward and the backward, right? And then from our experience with baggers, we know that there will not be necessarily commutation. The commutation arises for the smooth solutions that, of course, are simply calculated out of characteristics. But as soon as there are singularities, the two semigroups will not commute, right? This will be one possible, you know, uh, solution, right? But there will be many others as well. Of course, in the context of Vargas, you, you know that there is the analog of the one side of Lutz's condition is the, is the semi-concavity condition, right? Or the semi-convexity condition if you are dealing with the, with the backward, say, uh, resolution of the, of the Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So you know, again, that the space of the phase space, wherever it is, L infinity, L2, BB, the one you like for your semi-group, it will be always a split uh, into two sets. One which is reachable, very likely the one that fulfills this semi-concavity condition, yet in order to really identify this set, you have to know what this is C is. This is easy to do for quadratic Hamiltonians, but much more complicated for general convex Hamiltonian, right? But still, you know there will be a threshold, and beyond that threshold, when this kind of semi-concavity or semi-convexity condition is violated, these measurements will be not physical, will be due, right? To, uh, to, your, to your errors on, on measurements. And then the same happens. You go backwards with the viscosity solution, forward with the viscosity solutions, and then, you know, in some cases this will work. And when it works, you will say this is a reachable target. And when it doesn't work, you will say, well, this is somehow the best possible approximation you can get. And these are some drawings in which you see the dotted lines are the measurements you did in field. And then, you know, the solid lines are those that really correspond to how close you can get out of the viscosity solutions of Hamilton Jacobi to these measurements, right? So you see that, of course, you recover the shape, but for instance, you cannot recover the peaks that do not fulfill semi concavity condition. I will tell you then, I mean, the peaks are usually introduced by your measurement design the device that is too simplistic and doesn't understand that there is a semi-concavity condition involved on it, okay? So the idea of the proof you use here, you know, in a systematic manner, the ordering of solutions, the comparison principle, the fact that somehow the viscosity solution is the minimal one. And this is why even though all this I find is very beautiful, uh, of course is limited, you know, to the context of a scalar Hamilton-Jacobi equation. So as I said before, Challenging open problems in this field are the scalar conservation laws in multi-D, and it will be also, you know, systems of hyperbolic equations or general first-order quasi-linear uh, equations in which certainly, you know, Monge cones and so on should be taken into consideration, but certainly there is too much geometry on this for us to understand. So one point that is very important is that, okay, in 1D for Vargas, we were very lucky the backward forward resolution using entropy semigroups led to the L2 projection, and we were so happy. Now, if you do it in the case of Hamilton Jacobi, and this is natural in some sense, because we know that, you know, from Vargas to Hamilton, there is a shift on one of one space derivative, right? So L2 should not be the right topology for Hamilton Jacobi. This is something you as you observe. If you do the backward forward resolution on the left, you see an approximation of, say, the final target that is much more dissipative, right, than the L2 projection, right? So, in some sense, you realize that for Hamilton Jacobi, yet the right space in which the backward forward resolution can be interpreted as a projection is also an interesting open problem. But of course, both approaches are legitimate, and I will say these are probably the most practical ones from a practical perspective, right? Because you will say, if you have to solve backward the Hamilton-Jacobi equation, one possibility is to use viscosity solution backward and then forward, or the other one, if you are successful on this, and this will be tricky because, again, you will have to linearize Hamilton-Jacobi equations, 
something that is delicate, right? You could use just gradient descent algorithms on a least square L2 optimization problem. You should know that if you do these two approaches, you will not get the same, yeah, but you will get in some sense the same qualitative behavior. And this is what happens. For instance, take the multidimensional uh, Hamilton Jacobi equation in 2D. On the left, you see a target, two cones. This target is not achievable because the you know the the, the semi-concavity condition is not fulfilled. But if you do backward forward resolution using uh, viscosity semigroups, you see the envelope to the right, right? So you see somehow that what you get as approximation is the upper envelope that is fulfilling the semi-concavity condition. And here you see a video, right? So assume you are dealing with Hamilton Jacobi in 2D. At time t equal one, you make this measurement on field and you come to me saying, listen, you know, Enrique, um, I'm solving backwards the Hamilton Jacobi and at time t equal one, I have observed this behavior. Then I immediately will tell you there is some error on it because this doesn't really come out of a solution of the viscosity solutions of Hamilton Jacobi. It doesn't fulfill, you know, the, you know, the semi-concavity condition, right? That's the first remark. The second remark is doesn't really matter. Even knowing that there is some error on it, I will discover how much error there is, and I will give you the best possible approximation to this out of viscosity solutions, right? And then what you do is you solve first backward viscosity solution, you stop the simulation, and once you get the U0, now you solve forward viscosity solution in the forward sense, and you will see how this uh, geometric envelope appears, right? So you see first the video backward in time, you will see a little pause. This is the initial datum you recover out of the viscosity solution backwards, and then you move forward and you will see the envelope emerging, right? We go backward, backward, backward viscosity solution, stop, this is the initial datum. Now you restart forward, forward, forward viscosity solution. You see how this envelope emerges. And the gap between your measurement and this envelope is the error that was introduced on your measurement, right? And in this case, using this comparison principle, you can much more easily identify the class of initial data that correspond to a final target, right? So basically, is just take, you know, this backward resolution using viscosity solutions, whatever is as smooth, you know, all other possible initial data coincide, whenever you have a singularity, the initial data is above. This is just the simple explanation of Hamilton Jacobi in multi -D. And now if you want to recover a different proof of Colombo and Perolas, you say, okay, I do that for Hamilton Jacobi in 1D. And then using the transfer from Hamilton Jacobi to Barger's using one space derivative, I can achieve Barger's or any other convex flux in 1D. Of course, if you ask me, can you do that for hyperbolic systems? No, because I don't have this magic trick of moving into a scalar Hamilton Jacobi. If you ask me, can you do that for Kruskov theory, multidimensional scalar conservation laws? Unfortunately not. And these are two beautiful open problems. So these are again, uh, three examples in which in each of them, you see these are three different experiments. These are the measurements done on field, right? And then you see how in each case, you get the best approximation you can, right? So you see that in the first example on the left and the second example in the middle, there is some error, right? The measurements on field were done by the dotted lines. And the best you can approximate, this is for uh, Hamilton Jacobi again, is the solid lines. So in the on the left, you see a substantial gap because there is a you know severe violation of the semi-concavity condition. In the second case, you almost got it. I mean, there are two wells. In one of the wells, because it's compatible with the semi-concavity condition, you got it exact. But in the first well that was narrower. Uh, you know, and the semi-concavity condition was violated, you cannot fully achieve it. So this is how close you can get using the backward forward resolution, right? That I insist is not the L2 projection in the Hamilton Jacobi setting. And in the third case, you were lucky enough to have made your measurements fully correctly 
so that you know the the data measured are compatible with the Hamilton Jacobi semigroup, and then you get it fully. So just to conclude, uh, some comments uh, on perspectives. I will say that you could analyze the same problem for all nonlinear PDs you can think of, all of them, nonlinear heat equations, uh, viscose Hamilton Jacobi, uh, nonlinear Schrödinger equation, nonlinear waves, uh, whenever you know you have been able to build a good theory for the Cauchy problem now try to do it backwards so this is a good exercise right so it's like the same principle whenever you turn on the light you turn it off so here the same right so we have an agenda for decades by doing this right so for all you know non-linear pd problems in which we think that the forward semi-group is well understood try to now move backwards do it for navier stocks to the uh, in the context of Leres, uh, you know, seminar paper, for instance, right? Now, second remark, least square approach, very naive, very natural, the one that everyone will implement, be careful, it can be very tricky, because normally these problems, even when there is a unique backward resolution, can be very unstable, as for the heat equation, and it's very, very hard to make them work. And it's also very, very easy to do mistakes because it's very easy to stop the minimization algorithm just because you are tired and don't realize that you are actually very far right from, you know, uh, from the, you know, the target destination, right? Also, be very careful when you are doing numerics on these problems because it could well be that when you try to solve this backward problem, the geometric location, the geometric locus of the main features like shocks or singularities can be very, very hard to achieve. And you will understand that. You are experts on numerics for conservation laws. So you know that it's very hard to track shocks in the forward sense of time. Then it will be even harder to do it in the backward sense of time, right? Okay. So then note that you can always use backward resolution using entropy semigroups in the numerical sense or any say reliable numerical solver you can always do that by simply backward resolution but please keep in mind that least squares and backward resolution do not necessarily lead to the same uh, initial data and that very often except very particular cases the comparison of the two of them and the understanding of how one is linked to the other through you know, the, the correct functional setting can be very, very tricky, right? And then, of course, you know, as soon as you quit these two examples in which you have some kind of maximum principle, you have the one-sided Lipschitz condition or the semi-concavity conditions of uh, Hamilton-Jacobi equations, this will be very, very, very hard to fully analyze. So actually, you know, the papers are now are uh, Colombo Perolas, uh, the one we wrote with uh, Thibault Liar and the one we wrote with Carlos Esteve, on Hamilton Jacobi. And then you could add many other possible problems in which you consider, for instance, non convent fluxes, uh, systems, and of course, plenty of possible applications in the context of reinforcement learning. Because what has been done so far in reinforcement learning is very much computational, it's extremely smart, and it has been, you know, uh, very, very influential. In particular, there are beautiful lecture notes, uh, you know, books, uh, articles, uh, uh, video lectures by Bertzekas at MIT, for instance, right? So you see how far these people got, right? They said, you know, reinforcement learning is about identifying, you know, behavior of agents and try to understand how, you know, they determine what are their optimality criteria, their strategies, and so on. They said, we apply, you know, the principle of dynamic programming. We make everything numerical. We know that uh, dynamic programming leads to Hamilton-Jacobi equations and that the theory is very deep and very complicated. So you make everything numerical, and then we try to search on this uh, space, huge space of uh, discrete possible uh, scenarios. It was actually in this context that Bellman tuned the term cause of dimensionality. It was done for this, but then to a large extent forgotten by uh, mathematicians, in particular in the field of PDs. But computer scientists, engineers kept, you know, the original 
uh, philosophy of Bellman and said, okay, it's impossible to explore all this space of discrete trajectories, but if I use a stochastic gradient and, you know, of course, many other variants of this and a posteriori post-processing of what the first kick of a stochastic gradient gives you, we can do many things. And this is the successful theory of reinforcement learning nowadays. And you see how, you know, as soon as you ask the most elementary question of reinforcement learning, you are facing precisely the problem I was discussing here. So this is something extremely challenging, and I think it can be a very, very good field of work of research for analysts and numerical analysts, uh, in particular in the context of conservation laws and Hamilton-Jacobi equations, right? Uh, so thank you again. I'm sorry not to be with you. I would love to do it, but I am in Urbino in another workshop. Uh, but I hope uh, this this talk, uh, you know, will inspire some discussions, and I will be happy to to join you in Zoom anytime. Thank you. Okay. Uh, other questions, comments? Well, first of all, I hope uh, they will uh, hear me. Uh, very good comment on Friday afternoon, if I'm wrong, we have some developments in this direction by one of our thoughts, by Adam Stiller. Then, if I may ask, um, I saw that, uh, we all saw that uh, in some cases, you go back in time and you find too many initial data. This is what you said, was. No, no. I mean, Normally, when you go backwards in time with the velocity solution, you will only get one initial datum, right? Well, in the case of conservation laws, if you have an initial profile, it may happen that going back in time, you find a big set of initial data. Of course. You give the same profile, this is clear. But you will only one uh, viscosity sample, right? Ah, okay, okay. But finding too many solutions to our vector problems often means that there is too little information. In the applications you consider, do you have some reason suggested from the application to select one initial datum or the other? Well, I'm say that the one side that, uh, um, Yeah, I think, I think you have to have a previous knowledge, right? So let me, let, me, let me see how I can explain this. So when you go to the doctor, what happens? You go to the doctor, your symptoms are compatible with 10 different possible sicknesses. But uh, this, looks, this is on the encyclopedia, the 10 possible sicknesses, but some of them are only related to the infection of a mosquito that only lives in Madagascar. You have not been in Madagascar, so this, this possible origin is excluded, right? So you are adding information. And this then, this is a beautiful question, right? How, you know, you see also that somehow, you know, uh, this is why there is so much being done nowadays also data-driven. Because until now, applied mathematicians, we were living in the world of model-driven, say, dynamics, right? And then what we are saying is that as soon as you try to go backward in time, the model itself, it doesn't suffice to give you a complete description of all the initial data. So you have to add knowledge. In practice, this knowledge will, have, uh, will come from data. And this data will be in some sense, some kind of Tikhonov regularization of the least square problem, I would say. Right? In fact, I mean, this is something we did and is mentioned in one of the slides, some papers with Alaverdi and Pozo, what we do is to say, okay, so now assume that you are dealing with buggers. Okay, anyhow, in your mechanics, you are always adding viscosity, some little amount of viscosity. So then why do you consider the viscose buggers? And then when you do viscose buggers, the problem is parabolic again. And then you have backward uniqueness with a very bad stability estimate, logarithmic, depending on one over epsilon, of course, because when the, when the viscosity goes down, the, you know, the constant on the estimate will blow up, but you have backward uniqueness. And the backward uniqueness gives you the solution given by the viscosity solution. So in some sense, what I'm telling you is that if you ask me as a mathematician, I will tell you out of the possible collection of initial data, I will always choose the one given by the backward entropy 
or viscosity resolution. Okay, but then I am adding knowledge. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I'm adding, I'm adding the knowledge that you know normally physics is not evolving, uh, you know, like in a Markov chain in which I don't have any clue of how you know agents are interacting. No, no, no. For me, physics is evolving according to viscosity solutions, and then I get a unique solution. Okay, but it does not mean that in other contexts, like for instance, when you are dealing with, uh, you know, uh, pedestrian flow and so on, where, you know, the rankine ugonio condition uh, has to be preserved, but the shock, uh, you know, can evolve according to, you know, other criteria, you don't have to change your, your perspective. Thank you. Thank you for this. We have another question from Mauricio Falcone. Uh, how can you say? Can you uh, yes. ask this question? Uh, can, you you hear me? can you hear me? So, yeah. Yes. Hola. So, uh, good morning to everyone and to <laughs> Enrique. So, thank you very much for your uh, for your interesting talk. Uh, I um, I have two comments on this uh, kind of approach. So, the first one, I completely agree with the fact that passing to anything that will be you get something which is more, uh, reasonable and uh, easier with respect to conservation laws because you are dealing with Lipschitz continuous uh, functions uh, that are viscosity solutions. <clears throat> and you can always get back and forth just deriving in space because at least in one dimension, uh, you know that the derivative in space of the viscosity solution will be the entropy solution to the corresponding conservation law. So in 1D, everything is clear. In 2D or uh, in higher dimension, this is not the case, but in 1D it works. Uh, I have a question now for you that is the following. Perhaps it's, it's a stupid question, but since the final <clears throat> condition can be unreachable, it would be reasonable to deal with something which is an approximate uh, problem where you don't have to reach the final condition, but you must be in the neighborhood of that final condition in a, in a, in a specific norm. That's, that's completely true. I mean, you are completely right. Even, even in the case of, I mean, that's a very good question, Maurizio. Even in the case where the target is reachable, it could well be that to reach this target, you need an initial datum which is very complicated. That will be the one given by the backward entropy or viscosity solution. And you could say, well, but I don't want that such a complicated uh, initial datum. I cannot afford this in my company. I will be happy to get close to this target by some, uh, say, delta error. What is then the initial configuration? That's a very good question. We didn't address this one. Of course, our, our intuition is that if you give me a target and you allow me for a delta error, so you, I don't need to, I mean, this is like when you look to this, uh, you know, landing spot for helicopters, right? You see a circle and the circle has a center, but of course you don't expect the helicopter to land on the center, right? It is sufficient that the helicopter fits into this circle, right? So this is an approximate control problem. So if you give me this approximate control problem, you are relaxing the problem. And then of course the initial datum will be milder. It will be very natural for instance to analyze and this could be uh, my guess. Probably the initial datum you get is the one that corresponds to solving a viscose approximation to Hamilton Jacobi with a viscosity turn backward, right? But the viscosity has to be two very, very small so that it fits this delta. So my, my claim, my conjecture will be, I mean, conjectures are free, right? Uh, my conjecture will be, take any, any target, you give me a delta, you ask me that you want to get delta close to this target, okay, then put some viscosity mu delta, and then you do it by some bisection algorithm, right? And then, you know, you start with very low viscosity, then you will get very close, but maybe very complicated initial data. And then you will start increasing the viscosity. The initial data will get more and more simplified, but of course the distance to the target will uh, increase and increase. Okay, thank you. 
Okay. So say now, I think there is a good direction to investigate. Definitely. Uh, just another comment, if I, I am allowed. <clears throat> if you go to uh, general convex Hamiltonians, the situation will be much more difficult because, because you have to deal with the Legendre Fenchel transform of the Hamiltonian in order to get the op flux formula. So this is an additional difficulty. Formally, you can solve it. But in practice, you need the H star, which is the Legendre Fenchel transform. Yeah, you are right. So uh, I forgot to show this slide. This is actually the most important one because really the work was done by Thibault and, and Carlos, uh, the two postdocs in our group. And now both of them very luckily got the positions, uh, Thibault in academia and Carlos in industry, right? And this is, for instance, an example we worked with uh, Carlos recently, right? So this is the absolute value function, for instance. Mm -hmm. Okay. That, uh, by the way, we, we were looking for, I mean, certainly there are some articles, please let me know, but there is very experienced people here in, in conservation laws. We were looking to the corresponding articles for the, say, 1D scalar conservation law with the absolute value uh, scalar function and we could not find them. But of course you can do, I mean, you can do Khrushchev theory, you can work out, you know, how the entropy, you know, one sided Lutzen's condition works, how the semi-concavity condition works, and then you get, uh, you know, different, different drawings. In some sense, you are pushing this semi-concavity to the limit and then you get this kind of flat area. So this is to say, uh, Maurizio, that our theory, uh, is also applicable to, I mean, our work applies for general uh, Hamiltonian's age. What is harder is to really have a complete understanding of what is the threshold that is separating, right, uh, achievable from not achievable, because okay. there's not such an explicit sharp semi-concavity condition. The semi-concavity condition we prove normally for general Hamiltonians is a necessary condition, but is maybe not sufficient, except that for, you know, for uh, quadratic Hamiltonians. What where really the theory will not work is for non-convex Hamiltonians or non-convex for conservation. That we need Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. There are many issues. Sorry, there is another question. Okay, if you have time. Yeah, please. Yeah. It's a short question. You mentioned numerical difficulties for uh, finding differences. Uh, how good or how bad it is for backward, forward, front range? Is it clear, Enrico? Did you get the question? No, no. So, well, what well, I mean, I mean, I, so, yeah, is that, uh, you know, it's, it's very hard to, when you do backward forward resolution, you see numeric, it's hard to capture everything. But this is the equation. Even in the linear equation, when you try to solve the equation, because the time very really hard. I mean, it's easy to get uh, an idea of the general shape, but it's very hard to get uh, features, you know, specific features. This is why, you know, uh, undoing the Gauss convolution is one of the paradigmatic problems in uh, image processing and is well known to be extremely relevant and hard. Thank you. I'm sorry for uh, some I hope we will continue this discussion by email. I thank Enrico, I thank Maurizio, and I thank all of you. Now, again, we thank the Thank you again. Gira, 
Okay. Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Matteo Pio from the Space University. Please. Okay, thank you very much. In this talk, I will uh, present a part of my PhD, the work of thesis in collaboration with the Secretary of 